Good afternoon, everyone. We would like to begin the second session of the day. Um, my name is uh, Moan Yamini. I'm a partner at uh, Herzog Law Firm and a senior research fellow at the Shamgal Center. And um, uh, I'm very honored to uh, chair the second uh, uh, session of the day. Before we uh, start, I was asked to remind you to fill in your preferences for lunch if you haven't done so until now. Um, we have uh, four uh, distinguished speakers. Ms. Uh, Amy Palmore, former Director General of the Israeli Ministry of Justice and one of the first 20 members of the Facebook Now Meta Oversight Board. <clears throat> Professor Neil Netanel, Pete Cameron and Doe Chair in uh, Law at UC UCLA School of Law. Dr. Tomer Shadmi from the School of Computer and Engineering at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And Professor Fishman, uh, Orit Fishman Afori, law professor and former dean of the College of Management's Faculty of Law, who will talk about how can social media support democracy, or perhaps it should say whether it can support democracy. Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Ms. Palmore, who will provide us with a much required overview of the Meta Oversight Board. Okay, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, thank you for inviting me and it's great to be here. Um, for me, it's an opportunity to introduce the Oversight Board three years after its birth to the Israeli society in many ways. Many people have some kind of memory when it was announced. Uh, as it is typical in Israel, the only thing people noticed was that there was an endowment of $130 million and that we are 20 members. So I received a lot of text. Wow, congrats, sister. You're, you know, people did 130 million divided by 20. I tried to deny it. One of our trustees is sitting here, Professor Pulse. So just to let you know, this is how it is conceived in Israel. Uh, but ever since, um, and especially because in Hebrew, it is very difficult to explain what it is, the oversight board in Hebrew, I'll say it or basically is it a, a, a body, an entity that is supposed to supervise META in every aspect of its activities? How can you explain in a short and precise way what we're doing without letting people down and without disappointing them? Um, I'm starting with this because I want to give you some kind of a, uh, idea who are the board, board members and what is the purpose of the board. The purpose of the board is to promote free expression by making thorough, principled, and globally relevant decisions regarding content on Facebook and Instagram, and by issuing recommendations on uh, the relevant Facebook company content policy. Um, we don't have a good light on the faces of uh, the members. Somebody who interviewed me a few weeks ago told me, you look like an ad to Benetton. You know, the old ones still remember what it is. Um, but I must say, and I, and I want to say a few words about the composition of the board because I think that it's extremely important to understand it when we speak about, about decision making and we speak about diversity. Many people know to you know, that diversity is important. Diversity and inclusion is now like a buzz word and something that everybody should uh, uh, accept. But as a director general, I work a lot on, on being a diverse ministry and trying to invite every citizen in Israel to participate in the important work that we're doing and trying to be part of the policy makers within the government. I don't think that I really understood diversity until I joined the board, not only in terms that we come from different continents, okay? We are Americans, Europeans, Asians, Africans, and a member from Australia, uh, but we come from different professions, from different perspectives. We have, of course, distinguished law professors and a former American federal judge. We have people who come from NGOs. We have journalists, important journalists, who are editors of the most important uh, newspapers uh, in the world. We come from different uh, governments. And I think that only as time goes by, I can understand what it means when we discuss different issues, what it means 
when you come from a democracy, when you come from an authoritarian government, when you come from places where being online is probably your only way to express yourself. And the possibility, we tend to think that the big tech companies are super diverse. We see that, they talk about it. And yet, I think that only if you had the chance, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, you won't have the chance. If you, you would have the chance to listen to our discussions, you would realize what those different point of views bring to the discussion. And I can say about myself, because I've been a civil servant in Israel for 24 years, before joining the board, and I saw myself, when I joined the board, simply turning into a civil servant of the world. I know that some people think it sounds naive, but it wasn't naive. It was in the sense of understanding that there is a greater mission, and you can be there the way I saw myself in an Israeli Ministry of Service, which means trying to look at all the interests and making a principled and globally relevant decision. And I realized that some of my uh, colleagues, because they come from different professional perspective, have the freedom not to be balanced all the time, but to bring something which is typical to a person who is an activist, or typical to a person who is an academic and a, a researcher, or typical to a person who is an editor that has to decide that some things are more important than others. So this is just the opening. Um, many people don't understand how we work and, and what is this institution that is supposed to be a global Supreme Court. Or I would say, and again, in an Israeli perspective, I call it a regulatory startup. It's an experiment, first of all, and now we're, after three years, we just uh, renewed our uh, memberships for another three years. But when it started, and I don't think that people can evaluate how difficult it was, not only that, of course, we started just when the pandemic started, so all our meetings, I mean, we, had, we were planning to meet each other, but the concept of how to create this new tribunal and how to learn to work together and how to choose cases, which I think is probably the most uh, challenging uh, task that we have. But let's start by just explaining what we're doing uh, in terms of our regular work. So first of all, there are the user-generated appeals. User can appeal content decision to the board after the meta appeals process. I don't know how many of you are active on social media, have ever been blocked or had their content removed, but there is a process and there is a first appeal that everyone can appeal and receive some kind of response. Some people are smiling and I don't like those smiles. It's, it's a smile of, yeah, right, yes, yes, we've had that experience. And afterwards you can appeal to the board. I asked from for accurate stats and just to let you know, We've had so far 2.5 million appeals, and we have dealt so far with 41 cases. So it gives a notion of what are the capabilities on one hand of the board, but on the other hand, it's also what are the intentions of the board. We never meant, and I think that this is one of the um, problems when we try to uh, I'll say it as, as a government official in Israel, you can tell if, if the users are pleased when you go to the supermarket on Friday because people recognize you and they tell you everything they think about the services that your ministry is giving, right? When uh, you're on the oversight board, again, when you're in Israel, you, you hear the 9 million users on a daily basis, but seriously now, we don't have this kind of contact with our users, but we do assume that if 2.5 million believed in us and, 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 and tried to appeal to us, there are probably many of them that are disappointed and they don't understand what did we need this oversight board or this tribunal for. But our experience is to try and find the important cases, the ones that could have um, the opportunity to make uh, recommendations that will change for the better 
the experience of millions. So although the numbers are frightening, this is how it works. Another option is meta-generated appeals. Meta identifies and recommends potential cases to the board. Um, once we make decisions on that type of appeals, the specific decision is being implemented directly and immediately. If we decide to upheld the decision or to overturn the decision, a post will be taken down or will be reinstalled. The other uh, thing that started, I think, after a year that we've been working was the PAOs, the Policy Advisory Opinions. Meta uh, solicits a, a PAO from the board, and Meta will integrate the board's decision into its existing policy um, uh, dev, dev, development process. But I want to say about this, I don't know if you followed, if you remember the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, series about the cross-check system, I think it was one of the most um, disturbing discoveries of what is really happening in terms of content moderation and also I'm reminding myself and reminding all of us that we want to talk about social media and democracy, what it means in terms of democracy. I mean the fact that some users are privileged users uh, receive a special type of review, a special type of content moderation, and sometimes damaging and disturbing uh, materials that they share on social media have the opportunity to stay there for days, for weeks, and sometimes for months, while others don't. I don't, I think that even in Israel, I don't have to remind you of our one of our first decisions, which was the decision about President Trump. And I think that a year later, when we realized uh, what the cross-check system means, we could see uh, the relevance of uh, dealing with those two uh, issues. Um, case life cycle process, I think that it's, I mean, it's not that important, but there is one thing that I want to emphasize. Um, first of all, we, we are negotiating with Facebook um, when we choose a case, and sometimes once a case is chosen, they change their decision immediately because they realize that they did a mistake. Sometimes in spite of the fact that they decide to make the right decision after the case was chosen, we decide to continue with that case because we see something important about the mistake that they made, and we're trying to find more cases that reflect that type of mistake. Uh, another thing which is important is that we, uh, there's a case selection committee that works on that. We sit on that case selection committee in turns. Um, but the important thing is that we publish the case that we chose and we invite the public to give us their comments. And unfortunately in Israel, and I've talked about it with Professor Elkin Koren several times and with other academics in Israel and other people interested, um, I think that this is a, an amazing opportunity to make an impact and to share knowledge and to help us to make our decisions better because it is when we try to compare this process to a regular tribunal, there is nothing like that. I mean, if there is something novel about the oversight board, it's both the comments process and the amazing things that we've learned through that. This is one of the most interesting things that, that I like to read when we receive the case and when this is going on. And another thing is, is our opportunity to ask meta questions. And we ask them a lot of questions and difficult questions. And sometimes those questions are questions that we receive from us, our stakeholders, whether it's when we meet them on round tables or when we meet them through the comments process where they are raising those questions or raising the problems that they see. Why do I say that this is one of the most important things? Because basically, I think that one of the important things that the oversight board is capable of doing is to push meta for transparency. And I think that if I would ask most people sitting here in the room that are interested in, this, in those issues, I think that 
if, if they could ask for one thing, is to raise this, you know, imaginary curtain that we feel that so many things are hiding behind it, and try to look into the company, to try to look into its policies, to try to look into its decision making, into its priorities, into, into its algorithms, of course, and try to figure out what is really happening. And the other side of this process is, which questions Facebook chooses to answer and which questions it refuses to answer. And I think, and this is after expecting you, the audience, and I don't know all of you to do all kinds of things and to be interested in all kinds of things, I think it's um, the responsibility not only of academics who are uh, interested in that in terms of research, but also it's the responsibility of society and the media to follow our decisions in order to realize not only what we have revealed and what we have decided, but also what were those questions that Facebook or Meta refused to answer. Because if we would follow those things and if we would ask Meta to be accountable for those issues that it is trying to hide from us, the impact, impact of the board would be even greater than the things that we did uh, reveal and change. Um, we are talking about democracy, so I think that it's interesting to, uh, to see and to understand what are the seven strategic uh, priorities of the board. Um, and as you can see, uh, we made a very thorough process in order to understand our strategy, especially since when you receive 2.5 million uh, appeals, you have to understand what you're looking for. So our priorities are civic spaces and elections, government uses, use of Meta's platforms, crisis and conflict, treating users fairly, gender, automation, content and content curation, and hate speech. I think that the four first ones have to do with democracy. I mean, everything that has to do um, with crisis and conflict has to do with the power of governments and what happens when we are in areas of conflict. Uh, when we talk about government use, it is about the requests of governments from Meta uh, to take down content. And one of our achievements, for example, is the fact that Meta has accepted a recommendation that will uh, ensure that she will let every user know that their content was taken down following a government request. Um, I have to finish, I know. Uh, okay, this is our engagement team who asked me to invite you to uh, try to uh, scan this and think about uh, following the opportunities to uh, uh, share your comments on our cases. I do want to say something just uh, in order to finish this very short presentation. Um, we also have uh, our uh, reports where you can follow our decisions and when you, and more important than that, you can follow the issues that Meta is implementing. I think that the big question is what do they implement? And I think that it's a little, it's a little bit difficult for the single user to wake up in the morning and say to themselves, I can feel a change, I can see the change, but the change is happening. For the user in Israel, by the way, the change is happening slower than the user in the US or the user in other places where uh, the priorities of implementation are enabling us to see the change right now. I do ask you, the people who are here, to try and look at those decisions and look at the social media that you're using and try to find out not only what has changed, but what you would still want to change and ask us to change by participating in our processes. So this was just very short, but it can be followed by a lot of readings that I will be happy to share and I'm inviting you to read. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, I would like to invite Professor Neil Netanel, um, who I believe will take a more militant approach, uh, applying the concept of militant democracy to defend against social media harms. Okay, so uh, our panel asked the question, how can social media 
support democracy? That's a complex question. But the bottom line is that social media can best support democracy by causing much less harm to democracy. Uh, at present, social media inflict multiple harms on liberal democracy. In fact, I will say provocatively that on balance, social media are a disaster for established liberal, democ liberal democracies. <laughs> Online platforms thrive on amplifying disinformation, conspiracy theories, and pumped up outrage aimed at addicting users to the platform. They also foster the propagation of hate speech, online extremism, and violent incitement. Not surprisingly, the most comprehensive social science literature review to date concludes that social media are a significant factor in emergent authoritarian populism, dwindling political and social trust, and growing polarization in established democracies. Another meta-analysis finds that social media, social media use generally hampers gaining the political knowledge that is critical for effective democracy. Among other factors, the meta-analysis concludes, social media fosters a misperception that the news finds me, that all the news I need to know is going to appear in my feed. I don't need to look anywhere else. Relatedly, Social media have corrosive effects on democratic institutions. Democratic government cannot function without broadly accepted legitimate political authority and some basic consensus regarding how to validate truth and how to determine falsity. Yet online platforms radically undermine both those pillars. Social media undermines political authority. They fuel the disintegration of traditional and stable political parties. They empower free agent demagogues who appeal directly to voters and who are not beholden to party leadership. And they render effective government based on compromise exceedingly difficult. As my UCLA colleague and election law scholar Rick Hasen aptly concludes, the greatest danger facing Democracy today is a public that cannot determine truth or make voting decisions that are based on accurate information, and a public susceptible to political manipulation through repeatedly amplified, data-targeted, election-related content, some of it false or misleading. So the bottom line is this. It might seem more democratic to give anyone and everyone a voice. You need not just a voice, but an online megaphone. But in fact, democracy is not sustainable unless it is based on mediated political discourse. Political discourse must be mediated, first of all, by the media. And that must be a media that is committed to basic journalistic norms and ethics. Second, sustainable democracy must be mediated by strong, centralized political parties. As Yale political scientists Francis Rosenbluth and Ian Shapiro have shown, recent decades have seen the disintegration of top-down centralized political parties that offer voters a cohesive competing policy platforms with, with to choose. In country after country, liberal democracies have moved towards populist systems characterized by open party primaries, splinter groups, free agent politicians, and plebiscites. And notably, while that move might seem to be more democratic, in fact, it has been accompanied by dramatic increases in voter alienation and populist authoritarianism. So again, the idea that social media fosters democracy because it gives everyone freedom of reach, not just freedom of speech, might seem attractive when we focus on isolated cases of marginalized minorities who finally have a voice. But on balance, social media inflict significant harms on democracy. And that is especially so given that social media recommender systems, the content curation algorithms, are heavily skewed to propagating outrage and other emotion-driven content that maximizes user engagement. All right, so then the question is, what to do about it? 
There's no perfect solution, and there's no easy solution. At the very least, the goal should be to require social media to take full responsibility for the content on their platforms. As a general rule, social media should not propagate or amplify the types of content that trustworthy traditional media would refuse to carry. In other words, no hate speech, no violent incitement, no anti-democracy extremism, no knowing dis disinformation, no baseless conspiracy theories. Yes, fact-checked reporting. Yes, partisan opinion that clearly is a clearly identified as partisan opinion, as distinct from fact-based reporting. So how do we attain that goal? How do we move towards that goal? There is always a risk in looking to government regulation for a solution, especially when it comes to speech. But I don't think there's any alternative in this case. Democratic governments must act to prod and, if need be, require social media to take responsibility for preventing their platforms from inflicting harms on democracy. In large part, that is what the European Union is doing through its recently, recently enacted Digital Services Act. And that act, uh, and I know Professor Schultz talked about uh, hybrid regulation, right, where it's sort of co-regulation, which prods social media to, to, um, to act on its own in trying to minimize these harms to democracy. Um, that act is supplemented by two important codes of conduct that with the urgence of the European Commission, the major platforms have signed on to. And that is the code of conduct to counter illegal hate speech online and the strengthened code of practice on disinformation. In that regard, the European Union's proactive defense of democracy in the face of social media harms contrasts sharply with the neoliberal libertarian free speech approach that currently dominates social media regulation in the United States. The conceptual core of the European Union approach lies in the political theory and practice of militant democracy that arose as a central feature of post-war constitutionalism in Europe. Militant, militant democracy teaches us that democracy is inherently precarious. Democracy is inherently at risk of being undone at the hands of anti-democratic forces that, like Nazism in the Weimar Republic, exploit democratic freedom to undermine democracy. Democracies, it posits, must actively defend themselves against those threats, even when necessarily by preemptively limiting democratic liberties. So building on those insights, European countries outlaw anti-democratic political parties, private militias, group libel, hate speech, terrorist incitement, and Holocaust denial. More positively, and importantly, they also generously fund independent public service media and impose strict regulations on political advertising. So they view such measures as vital to promoting the basic political trust social cohesion and respect for diversity upon which enduring democratic governance depends. Significantly, militant democracy finds support in international human rights jurisprudence as well as national constitutional law. For example, the European Convention on Human Rights provides that nothing in the convention shall imply for any state, group, or person any right to engage in any activity aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set out in the convention. And the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights contains a nearly identical provision. For that matter, Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights requires signatory countries to prohibit the advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. And importantly, European countries understand that discrimination, not just as a personal affront, but also as the denial of equal participation in the democratic process. Overall, as the European Court of Human Rights has affirmed, effective political democracy is a prerequisite 
who are preserving fundamental freedoms. So how does the European Union apply the core principles of militant democracy to digital platform regulation? So firstly, basic principle uh, is that under the DSA, what is illegal offline is also illegal online. This primarily concerns hate speech and terrorist incitement. Under the DSA, under the DSA and the codes of conduct, Online platforms must expeditiously assess and act upon notices of illegal content submitted by trusted flaggers. And trusted flaggers are NGOs uh, that national authorities have certified as having expertise in detecting and identifying hate speech, terrorist incitement, and other illegal content. Now, under European Union law, Platforms that host user posted content are not liable for illegal content of which they have no knowledge. And the, DC, the, the DSA does not change that. But the DSA provides a strong incentive for very large platforms to proactively remove illegal content. It requires that those platforms carry out and submit to European regulators an annual risk assessment that among other things must evaluate the systemic risk of dissemination of illegal content through their services. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, the leading social media platforms have agreed with the European Commission to abide by the code of conduct to counter illegal hate speech online. And that code of content expresses the platform's public commitment to review the majority of valid notifications for the removal of illegal hate speech in less than 24 hours uh, and to disable uh, the content uh, when necessary. All right, second, speech that is legal but awful, right? Uh, speech that is not illegal offline but that undermines democracy. And here the primary focus is on the very large platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. The DSA uh, provides that very large online platforms must conduct an annual assessment of any systemic risks stemming from the design or functioning of their service, including their algorithmic systems, in other words, the recommender, the recommender systems, or from uses made of their services. And according to the DSA, the systemic risks include, among other things, actual or foreseeable negative effects on civic discourse, electoral processes, or the exercise of fundamental rights. The platforms are required to assess the possible impact of any intentional manipulation of their service, including by inauthentic use or automated exploitation, such as the deployment of fake accounts, coordinated propaganda, uh, and bots. The DSA requires those platforms uh, to put into place reasonable, proportionate, and effective mitigation measures tailored to the specific systemic risks that have been identified. And those measures may include modifying the services recommender system, modifying its, its content moderation pro, uh, process, and modifying its advertising system, right, among other measures. And then finally, supplementing the DSA, the strengthened code of practice on disinformation which 34 leading platforms and technology companies have signed at the behest of the European Commission. The code signatories undertake to employ measures to mitigate the risk that their services will fuel the, the viral spread of harmful dissemination. These include, among other measures, employing recommender systems designed to improve the prominence of authoritative information and reduce the prominence of disinformation. And they must do so based on clear and transparent methods and approaches for defining the criteria for what counts as authoritative information. All right, so in many ways, the DSA and the Codes of Conduct provides just a skeleton, and I provided just a very brief sketch of that skeleton. But the bottom line is that a lot needs to be worked out, right? We're just at the very beginning of this regulatory process. Among other things, I'll just briefly say that it's still unclear what measures must be taken to protect users against errors and biases in content moderation. 
And this is especially so given it's not at all clear uh, how due process might work. Certainly human review might work given the vast, vast scale uh, of automated content moderation right, uh, in this space. In any event, uh, the European Union, to my mind, has taken the lead in defending democracy against social media harms, and we are fortunate that it has done so. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, now, I'm honored to invite Dr. Tomer Shadmi from the uh, School of Computer uh, and Engineering at the Hebrew University and the Federman Cyber Security Research Center. Uh, Tomer offers, uh, I think, one of the best sports metaphors I've ever encountered. Uh, how to protect public, public discourse from man-to-man -to, -man to zone defense. So, does anyone recognize what we are seeing here? So this is artwork by Clary, who used uh, Petri dishes in order to do uh, some art. So it's Petri dishes and bacteria. And I will argue today that platform function as Petri dishes of public discourse. In Petri dishes, what is growing from the Petri dishes is only the thing that you have in the substrate. There is the only way. In the same manner, the discourse on platform is a result of engineered and controlled environment that the platform provide for good and for bad. So I argue that the contemporary challenge of social media push us to make a transition from focusing on the freedom of speech to focusing on protection of the public discourse as vibrant public discourse is a condition for democracy to survive. It is a shift from focusing on specific uh, expression and specific speaker into uh, focusing on the affordances and constraint of the, dis of, of pet, of, of the platform Petri dishes. I will expand this shift uh, first theoretically and then second from functional point of view in, in relation to the most serious risk we are facing. Finally, I will demonstrate this approach of intervention and analysis in the test case of misinformation. And this photo is taken from Instagram uh, of Creativity from Democracy, which is an uh, Instagram page uh, that takes some photo from the demonstration in Israel, some very uh, interesting uh, uh, signs. And here it's written, uh, crash the econo economy, divide people, and kill democracy, stop. And I think we can uh, address the same call to social media. So the public discourse, and, or as Nancy Fraser put it, public discourse says, uh, are necessary for democracy. Without them, democracies die. Uh, why they are so necessary? So there is a lot of answer from a lot of disciplines and, and scholars, but first it's for, to inform the citizens, it's for the accountability of the government, it is like uh, Robert Paul say, a medium for individual and collective expression, and then also for individual and collective self-determination. It is like uh, the people who support the, the uh, uh, free marketplace of idea is for, for the, the purpose of, of finding the true, or as Hannah Arendt say, building common sense, common sense of reality, uh, or, or constructing shared truth, Oh, uh, and also um, Aaron said that natality, which is the, the, the articulation of new understanding, identities, idea, and action. Natality, our uh, ability to, to born, is also the ability to, to reinvent things and idea and identities. Uh, so all of these uh, rules are the backbone of democracy without them political participation and therefore democracy, the rule of the people, are not really possible. Uh, on the theoretical level, it doesn't matter which justification of freedom of, of expression you hold, the democratic one, the free market one, or uh, the one based on autonomy. 
uh, protection of freedom from expression and the protection of the public discourse are the same, uh, are two sides of the same coin. The, the, the justification that start, like the democratic justification in a, in a free market of ideas, they see the public discourse as a purpose, and then freedom of expression as a means to, 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 to establish the purpose. And as Robert Post told us in this uh, uh, article, also the one that holds that freedom of expression is end in itself and it's important because uh, of autonomy, see public discourse as a means and the way that the, the arena in which this autonomy is realized. So it doesn't matter which uh, uh, place you hold, uh, protecting the uh, public discourse is part and maybe the heart of protecting uh, the freedom of speech. And in contemporary uh, uh, reality, the uh, platform are the petri dishes of these public discourses, global public uh, discourses. And the platform are not a, and never been a, a white canvas for our conversation. They are engineered and regulated environment designed to maximize the goals of the platform following the business models of surveillance capitalism, which does not uh, necessarily align with democratic uh, uh, goals. Usually in this kind of discussion, we discuss just like the policy and content moderation, but the regulation of the platform uh, of the public discourse is much, much uh, deeper. It's, this is only the tip of the iceberg. So it starts with the architecture, question of decentralization, centralization, where is the data, where is the computing taking place, interoperability, the ability to, to, to speak between platform. And then we have the ranking algorithm, the curation, the algorithm that decide uh, uh, which content we will see and which content we are not see, which people we will see, uh, um, this is one. Here you can see uh, Twitter released like three uh, weeks ago uh, the code of engagement. So this is part of the regulation of the public discourse, much, much, much important than content moderation. And then we have the user interface, the design, which is also very important part of, of, of public discourse. It's what we can do and what we cannot do, uh, we, what we can see, what we cannot see, where we can comment and where not, all this design. And just then we have the policy and content moderation. And here you, you remember the photos before from this uh, uh, page in the Instagram. So the, the uh, the one that, that, that uh, ran this uh, uh, page, uh, Kineret Rosenblum and Eyal De Leo, I think, th they just one day got this method, sorry, this page isn't available. They didn't know why, how, uh, uh, what is the, and they didn't have any uh, uh, right to appeal. Uh, but after a few days, it came back. It was, so all of this are the regulation of the public discourse today. Um, okay, so and all these regulation create harms, and as we already discussed, and we can like put it in two kinds of harm. First is the harm that came from the business model, uh, some externalities, social and political externalities of the business model, like Neil said, uh, radicalism, ampl amplification of false information, hate speech, all these issues. Uh, and I have this paper that I will talk uh, later about it. And also we have the thing that all our communication, pu uh, public discourse is on uh, uh, the, the logic of surveillance, and then people have a chilling effect and, and those doesn't want to speak. And another problem is a democratic deficit because the limit of the uh, uh, public discourse, what is allowed, what is not allowed, the content moderation, uh, community standards, all of these are the platform, uh, kind of the platform mandate, and, and the user cannot participate in this. So the user cannot uh, be part of the way that the public discourse is organized. And I have these uh, two papers that 
uh, discussing, and later we will discuss uh, lack of due process with ORIT. So, so the question as I see it is not whether to regulate public Discord petri dishes, the platform, but rather how and who will do it. And what I'm suggesting is to move from man-to-man -man, uh, defense to a uh, uh, zone defense, uh, which means looking on the structural issue, looking on all these uh, uh, layers of regulation I, I show you before, and not concentrate on, on particular um, uh, expression or particular speaker. So in order to know what we should what we want to defend, what, what we are defending, we should know what is the good public discourse, what is democratic public discourse. In order to do this, uh, so I, I put here together some, some of Robert Post's writing and some other from Habermas and Hannah Arendt and, and other uh, thinker, because, and, and I'm now working on this paper because I think in order first, the court in Gonzales, for example, and legislator, and also the, the platforms themselves, in order to know what we should achieve, what is the vision, what, what is good democratic uh, public discourse, and what is bad, and what are the metrics for deciding what is good and what is bad, we, we need to, 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 to do this exercise. So I, I want uh, I, say, I don't have time right now, but I think it's important. And I think, for example, natality, the, the, the ability to, to find new ideas and understanding is one of the most uh, interesting and important, also in relation, or especially in relation to the new uh, generative models, new uh, uh, large uh, language model, because one of the, for me, one of the most serious problems there is this think of the circularity, that we are continuing uh, uh, the same ideas, the same, and cannot uh, um, create new ideas. And so I, I took all this uh, um, framing and looking on misinformation as a test case. And what's interesting in misinformation is first that the harms are not individual. Uh, unlike, for example, even hate speech, hate speech damage concrete individuals or group, but, but misinformation damage the public uh, discourse. This is the main damages. It damages the public discourse because it's, it's, we, we, we cannot really have good public discourse with all those uh, 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 misinformation and disinformation. We don't have enough uh, good knowledge. And also we lose the faith in the ability to have a shared uh, a notion of reality and a shared truth. The idea that something like this is possible uh, uh, become uh, uh, disappear. So the, the damages are for the public discourse and are structural, but also the causes of misinformation are not individual, but more structural. Here you can see uh, Cindy Powell uh, which in this talk said that the election was stolen by uh, uh, American intelligence that helped uh, Biden. And she said it in, uh, like you see, 5 January uh, 2021, a day before the Capitol Hill uh, event. And the thing here, it's not that somewhere in the internet this, this video is exist, but rather look on this, this is, a site that I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting all my uh, reputation on the site, but, but it's look very serious. And it said, and it put every day the uh, most recommended uh, uh, content in each day and each platforms. So it's not the most uh, viral content, but rather the content that the platforms themselves push and amplify. So. A day before the Capitol Hill event, YouTube put this uh, video in the 10 most uh, uh, recommended uh, issue. So the issue here, it's also the damages are to the public discourse and structural, and also the causes. It's not just Sidney Powell fault, but rather the whole uh, platform fault. So what I'm suggesting that 
to do some structural uh, um, intervention in order to prevent those kind of issue. Uh, um, before that, so we have this, what I call man-to-man -man defense that we, we, we saw in this event. And I'm suggesting that it, and, and this of course have a, lo a lot of problem in relation to freedom of speech. And then the platform say, oh, we cannot do it. It's either to, to, to harm a public discourse or to have misinformation. We are not the arbiter of truth. But what I'm saying that we can do some structural intervention that damage much less the, the freedom of speech of the users, might uh, damage uh, the platform, but not the users. And doing this can help uh, uh, um, uh, to, to face the problem of missing and disinformation. And I'm suggesting two kinds of intervention. The first intervention is intervention into the, the recommended engine, the engine that decides uh, who will see which content. And I'm not, I will not enter into the, it all in the paper, but the question is who determines the optimization objective, which objective are legitimate and which are not, and should uh, optimization should be, have some limit in, in or, in, you can find it in, in the paper, but the idea is again not to look for uh, the, the characteristic of the feature of false in information as concrete kind of information, but rather to change the whole uh, landscape or, or to rethink the whole uh, landscape. And I have another uh, suggestion related to, to bot and uh, fake accounts, which, which are very important uh, uh, feature that uh, uh, contribute to this information, but, but I don't have time right now. Uh, so just to finish, uh, let's see the effectiveness of this kind of defense. Here you can see some article who say that the only thing that, that stopped Shaquille O'Neal from, 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 from being, from, from having all these uh, 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 points in, in the basketball is that the, uh, NBA legitimized Zoom defense in the beginning, uh, 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 I think in 20 years ago or something. And in the same manner, here you can see that the leaked document, one of the leaked documents of Francis Hogan, in which Facebook, Facebook itself say that if he will put away uh, uh, the, the recommended system, it will uh, decrease 30 to 50 percent of misinformation without banning anyone, without deleting any content, that just changing uh, the engine itself. Uh, so just to, 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 to put it together, and then the question, again, th those infor intervention can damage or can harm the, the, the freedom of speech of the platforms themselves. And here we, we, we have also in constitutional law and also in international uh, human rights law, the structural approach and, and positive duty, uh, which say that in order to, to that we have the right to freedom of, of expression, but it's not just to respect, uh, we discussed it before uh, about Germany, but also to protect and fulfill, and protect and fulfill freedom of speech means also respect and pro uh, uh, protect and fulfill public discourse, which is to, to, to provide the infrastructure and structure that will uh, 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 enable us to have public discourse and enable us to have uh, democracies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomo. Um, I would like to uh, um, I would like to uh, invite Professor Ruth Fishman of Fori, uh, who will speak uh, about uh, this uh, subject from a, a different perspective, uh, the perspective of procedural uh, standards. So first, I would like to thank Niva for putting to, and the organizers for putting together this uh, wonderful uh, event. Uh, but I've got the worst slot of being uh, the last presenter before lunch. And, uh, and on top of this, most of my points were already raised. But I do hope to illuminate some new uh, angle. And as Kevin said in the first panel, my presentation does not belong to the, the uh, over or under filtering debate, but rather I'm, a, I'm part of those who are very concerned about the power, 
the excessive powers of the platforms, and this is going to be in my focus. So, the wrong way. So, to begin with, since I'm the last speaker, I would like to open with my bottom lines and uh, present the entire stance in natural. So the background of our discussion is the reality in which uh, uh, the online environment is operated uh, by online intermediaries, which are all of them private commercial uh, companies. And the conflict we are addressing here uh, regards the fact that the online intermediaries uh, control the flow of information and they conduct or not conducting a, a content monitoring with very minimal obligations uh, and according to their own commercial policies. Uh, therefore, the content moderation challenges, of course, freedom of speech. And online intermediaries are expected, as we heard by Neil and by other presenters, are expected to strike the appropriate constitutional balance, although they are private commercial entities. So against this backdrop, my proposals in the line of projects, this is my trilogy I will going to present, uh, my projects uh, aim to explore whether and how some of the basic administrative law standards, administrative law procedures aimed at guaranteeing procedural justice could be imposed on online intermediaries. So to put, to put my uh, presentation in the context of this panel, which is addressing democracy, uh, my stance is that in order to maintain a democratic civil society in the online sphere, we must insist on true, real, genuine, full-fledged uh, democratic procedures in the decision-making process of the platforms, uh, uh, and we should not accept anything less than that. Uh, procedural justice is at the heart of democracy, uh, it is the technique uh, for securing substantive human rights. And the term procedure should not be confused with bureaucracy. Uh, as we all know, only badly designed procedures may generate bureaucracy. By, but procedures are the good things. Bureaucracy is the bad side, you know, the downside of procedures. So to the background. Uh, the digital sphere is operated by a pyramid. We can envision a pyramid of intermediaries. Uh, uh, the important point, as I stress, is that all these intermediaries are private commercial companies. These intermediaries include, uh, at the bottom uh, uh, levels, the infrastructure, you know, the, oh, the cables in the oceans, and uh, the, uh, the ISP, uh, internet service providers, the ISPs. And on the upper level, we have the social, uh, 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 the service providers, the social media, all, all the services we uh, dab as platforms. Uh, uh, yet, it is very important to understand that intermediaries in all layers are involved in the flow of information, all of them, and thus may function as valves uh, that control the contents in their pipelines. Uh, I think most presenters uh, address the upper levels of the platforms, but we should uh, uh, remember that also the infra infrastructure uh, uh, levels are also intermediaries. When we discuss blocking orders, for example, in Europe or in Israel, this uh, uh, content moderation practices is addressing the, the lower uh, level uh, of intermediaries, which are also involved in content moderation, and therefore are relevant to our democratic uh, discourse. So after presenting um, the players, let's frame again uh, the conflict, very short, as, we, as was already uh, explained at length. Today, digital uh, freedom of speech is a major concern. All forms of content moderation, if even are made for achieving a justified cause, and I, I agree, totally agree with Neil, may conflict with freedom of speech since may end up with a wrong removal. Uh, this is the false positive a, a removal, namely these various practices may remove legitimate contents, thus silencing speech. And as will be discussed uh, in, in the next panel, uh, uh, the fact that content moderation is operated currently by machines, whether these machines are operating AI or not, doesn't matter, it's a algorithmic uh, uh, systems and mechanism, amplifies the problem. Uh, a good example is provided by um, the recent transparency report released by uh, YouTube with regard to the operation of the content ID 
system, which is also kind of a content moderation, uh, uh, addressing uh, allegedly copyright infringing contents. Uh, and this uh, transparency report revealed uh, uh, that a large amount of false positive takedowns do exist. Namely, overblocking is real. So to the legal question, online intermediaries are private companies. Since content monitoring is governed by private entities, the measures used are lacking the basic elements embedded in public law. Uh, and the question, therefore, is whether and how public law principles, including procedural justice uh, standards, could be imposed on these online intermediaries. So uh, a few words, a theoretical few words, about the private and public law divides. Uh, in contrast to the perception that a rigid line differentiates between public and private law, modern law perceptions outside the US, <laughs> and look, looking at Robert, uh, modern law perceptions hold a much more complex understanding perceiving public law and private law as a continuous spectrum of contingencies. While with respect to state actors, like the government, public law princ principles should be applied in full. Uh, uh, they are further along the curve in between situations uh, in which non-state actor that nevertheless uh, uh, would be subject to some public law principles. Uh, uh, while these perceptions are more uh, uh, common in Europe countries, in Germany, for example, in Israel as well, uh, it should be said that in the US, uh, the state action doctrine, uh, to a large extent, still prevents the development of such dual or mixed or hybrid legal norms. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, profound legal initiatives worldwide addressing digital governance related to content moderation practices. I think most of these initiatives were already mentioned in previous panels. We have in the EU, the UK initiative, uh, uh, the online harm bill was not mentioned, but we have in the EU, uh, UK, of course, the, the, the uh, DSA. And uh, zooming to the very active uh, EU uh, environment. Uh, there is a line, actually, of fair regulation, some adoptance, some still pending. The AI Act is still pending, uh, each addressing a different aspect of the broader uh, picture. Uh, together, these regulations, I think, appear three dots on a curve uh, of the emerging EU uh, uh, digital governance regime. So it is very uh, important to explain uh, that all initiatives adopt some elements of procedural justice. Yet even the EU legislative, which is the DSA, which is no doubt a landmark uh, 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 legislation, uh, which is uh, the farthest reaching one, is not taking the full-fledged path of imposing true, genuine, real public law principles on online intermediaries. This path has failed. Uh, so the missing link, uh, uh, in all these initiatives is the adoption of a mandatory standard regarding basic procedural justice or due process and norms. And what does it mean, due process? What does it mean, procedural justice? It is very popular to argue or to claim that the online platforms should uh, be subject to the standard of accountability. Uh, the word accountability was raised a few times. You know, this is a buzzword like trustworthiness, you know. So the question, what does it mean? What does, what does it mean we mean when we say accountability? And accountability is a very vague notion that should be translated or unpacked into concrete norms. In public law, accountability is uh, translated into three golden con concrete uh, uh, standards or rules. First one is transparency, uh, namely full disclosure, full disclosure of a decision made giving full reason, the reasoning, uh, to the decision held that includes all relevant information. And finally, uh, uh, allowing an appeal uh, that would be to an external, objective uh, a, a body that its decision binds the, the, the platform. So uh, these actually are the, the very basics of administrative, administrative law in all democracies. Uh, and as, as I stressed in my opening, I think this is a standard which should, uh, that should be required on a mandatory basis in order to democratize the, the, the online environment.
I think that annual, trans uh, annual transparency reports, voluntary oversight boards are a very good start, but they are not providing the basic package of administrative law. It's not true administrative law. Uh, and the question is um, how such procedural justice standards could be introduced into the conduct of the online intermediaries through the back door in light of the failure of the legislator to uh, 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 require a mandatory standard. So in a line of projects, this is my uh, own three, uh, the tri trilogy, I have just a question each, each time from a different uh, perspective. So this is the Marilyn Monroe connotation. It's the same figure with different colors, no any hint to a Warhol pending case. Uh, so in my first project, I proposed to use a doctrine of hybrid do bodies. I think this is the, the doctrine with, that was mentioned by Professor Schultz, the indirect implementation in the German uh, uh, context. In the second uh, project, I, I addressed a new avenue of global administrative law. I think it's a failure. Uh, and the third project, which, which I think is the most prog pragmatic one, uh, I thought in this uh, third project, I focus on a corporate governance uh, as a very useful potential vehicle. And I will say a few words about each one of them, and with that, I'll finish. So as to the hybrid bodies, uh, as I just told Professor Schultz, hybrids, you know, with the, this is the, the new buzz, you know, everything is hybrid, everything is mixed because we are we live in a very complex and sophisticated world, so everything should be blurred. So hybrid bodies is a doctrine adopted in some European countries, I think uh, headed by Germany, uh, that applies a dynamic perception regarding the divide between public and private law. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, Article 6 to the Human Rights Act stipulates that obligations of public authorities apply to any person or body performing functions of a public nature. Namely, in the UK, the Human Rights Act ex explicitly acknowledged the potential application of public law uh, on uh, uh, private bodies. Uh, in other states, such as in Israel, the hybrid bodies doctrine is a court-made rule. In Hebrew, it's called the Gufim Dumautim. Uh, and uh, under is Israeli common law, private entities that fulfill a public function may be forced by court to apply certain administrative law standards being acknowledged as uh, uh, hybrid bodies. I think this is one of the uh, uh, Justice Barak decisions that he was being blamed for being an activist, but this is not a real activism. This is a very standardic uh, uh, perspective in European uh, legacy. Um, and the point is that considering the central role of online intermediaries in the digital environment, I think the, the voices calling for adoption of the hybrid bodies doctrine are growing stronger. Uh, it should be noted that in the British ca case of Richardson, it's a very poor case, held in two, 2015, uh, the High Court refused, the, the UK High Court refused to hold Facebook and Google as the hybrid bodies under British domestic law. However, this is a very short decision, no reasoning, uh, no profound explanations. Uh, and, is, and in Israel as well, the court thus far did not uh, 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 adopted this uh, doctrine with regard to the online intermediate, though this doctrine is always uh, being pushed by the, by the litigants. A second path, as I said, uh, I'm stressing, is a global administrative law. Um, a few words about global administrative law. GAL, uh, global administrative law, is emerging new project uh, initiated at NYU, uh, inspecting both, I, I would say, descriptively and normatively, uh, the conduct of transnational bodies, such as the World Bank, such as ICANN, ESO, and so on and so forth. And these bodies, it seems, voluntarily adopt administ administrative law-like procedures uh, uh, in order to foster their legitimacy. And the argument is that the, the major online platforms, Google, Facebook, and so on, being a multinational company, uh, should do the same. I know it's a very uh, a complex argument to go from NGOs to uh, uh, commercial companies, but 
we should uh, look at these transnational bodies and look how they earn from adopting true administrative law-like uh, procedures. And finally, as I said, uh, uh, I uh, propose the corporate governance path. Uh, uh, without getting into the details, uh, today corporate governance principles are used to lever uh, the conduct of companies to meet social needs. This is a much discussed corporate social responsibility standards or the known uh, ESG standards of responsibilities. And many policy documents encourage, encourage such uh, initiatives from uh, the UN attempts <laughs> uh, to tie companies to human rights uh, uh, standards. Uh, uh, we have the more, more pragmatic uh, um, OECD principles and policies encouraging responsible uh, uh, business conduct. And their argument, to be very short, is uh, that uh, such initiatives should uh, be also leveraged uh, to introduce procedural justice uh, standards by the major tech companies, Google, Facebook, and so on. There are many mechanisms uh, uh, that may push companies uh, to adopt higher standards, uh, semi-voluntary codes, uh, codes of best practices, or you know, they comply or, or explain a mechanism which is very popular in corporate law worldwide. Uh, and the most important point is that many, if not all, of the big tech companies are incorporated in California. Uh, and therefore, the relevant US uh, uh, authorities may serve to promote such social responsibility goals. For example, the SEC is one a, a optional regulator that could push a, a for a using the corporate governance path for elevating the conduct of the uh, uh, platforms. So to conclude and keep my time frame, uh, procedural justice is essential, is an essential element in demo democratizing the digital sphere. And I think this is the meta question of democracies right now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would like to take the discussion to the, um, uh, to the uh, level of the normative justifications for free speech um, and to ask what is uh, perhaps a, some, a somewhat uh, provocative question. Um, uh, Alexander Michael John, who uh, Tomer uh, uh, referred to, um, um, is famous for the saying that uh, what is essential is not that everyone shall speak, but that everything worth saying shall be said. Um, he wrote that uh, against the background of a mass media market in which the power to speak was concentrated in the hands of the few. Um, and since the introduction of the internet, um, the, the personal autonomy rationale has kind of uh, taken the front seat in, uh, in uh, thinking about uh, normative justifications for free speech. And so my question is, um, did we come back full circle to, uh, to Michael John, um, um, albeit for different reasons? Uh, and, and perhaps uh, what is essential is not that everyone shall speak, but uh, that everything worth saying shall be said uh, under the current circumstances. Is this working? Yeah. I'll try an initial stab at it. It might as well be the first one to fall on my face. Um, so I, I think. Uh, Freedom of speech, there is an important personal autonomy and self-definition element to it, right, which is not captured by Michael John. But as has famously been said, there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom of reach, right? So uh, the ability to speak uh, to a street corner, to people you know, that's freedom of speech. The ability to reach 10 million people across the globe is freedom of reach. And for that, the fundamental justification is Michael John's justification, right? Um, so there, there are um, democratic needs and social needs that uh, are the primary focus of whether we want to have freedom of reach. And it, in that sense, I, I do think that there is some argument that if everything worthwhile has been said, then you know, that need is satisfied. I think we forgot a little bit about the pandemic, but I think the pandemic was a huge challenge. 
I don't know if we can still remember that at the beginning we didn't know. Nobody knew. Not even the ones that we expected to know. And I think that one of the big challenges on the platforms, and we wrote a PAO on that just lately, was what should be really in the reach of everyone when we need, first of all, the public discourse on how should we deal when, when governments made decisions that we could not even imagine just a month before they happened, and when a professional discussion on how to treat ourselves, we're not talking about the extreme ideas, but all kind of ideas were, I, I don't remember how to say it in English, uh, the, the, the idea of, of yeah, the herd theory. It was logical in the beginning. You know, we had that with chickenpox with our children, and, and this is how we were raised. And all of a sudden, raising those ideas was unheard of. And then the platforms developed, if you remember, the interstitials. If you need more information, we, we, we will enable you to be exposed to those ideas, but we recommend you to look at uh, reliable information at the World Health Organization. So it's more complex. When we want to speak about democracies, it, it takes us to other places. But the pandemic was, uh, I think, an important test to the importance, not of, as you said, just freedom to say something, but really the accessibility of knowledge which is not only one answer to each question, but a true um, need to be fruitful on, on, on those discussions and to have the opportunity to think and to criticize the most reliable institutions at that moment. Uh, just to add something that I think one of the thing that we should do, and it's, as I understand it, part of the shift of looking on the public discourse itself is looking on, I think Neil also said it before, looking on the right of the listeners, not just the speakers, but also the listeners. And, and it's also part of the human right to freedom of expression, the, the, the right to receive information. So if we will take seriously the right to receive information, it helps us to think also about uh, uh, this issue, it, it's related to, to, to what is worth saying. And okay, so just uh, a freedom of speech a scholar, but uh, I think that, you know, mentioning again Justice Barack, Chief Justice Barack, I think that freedom of speech is not an absolute right, and it should be balanced uh, with other conflicting interests, and, you know, the proportionate, the European proportionate uh, proportionality test should be applied, and I join Neil, I think the European perspective that, you know, it, it, the freedom of speech is saying what you want, but we, you, we, sh we should protect society from harmful speech, and with this I'm a militant like uh, Neil. <laughs> Neva? Militant. Um, my question, so first question is, is whether indeed platforms um, are the problem, right? They might be part of the problem, but uh, selling audience what they like is a problem of the media, right? I mean, this is what newspapers are doing. This is what the media broadcasters are doing. Um, and, but I think, um, you know, um, as we, you know, polarization was something that we experience nowadays, but Europe has experienced this in the 20s, if the next, of the last century, the past century. Uh, so maybe this is all has to do with other processes, uh, you know, that, you know, or developments um, in society. And so uh, to what extent the, the problem is with platforms or the, the problem is with polarization 
in liberal democracies that have to do with a lot of sociological you know, and, and other aspects of, of politics. And if that is so, and that comes to the second question, is whether the platform or the solution. Uh, you sort of uh, expect platforms to make decisions about disinformation. In Israel, the problem is that the, we have disinformation coming from the government, the, the prime minister. We disagree. In the United States, some of the problems were that you know, the president of the United States was perceived by some people as you know, spreading disinformation. Who is going to decide whether you know, pro-abortions or you know, uh, murderers or the protesters in Israel are anarchists? We have a polarized society. We disagree. And the question is whether, in the, if that is the case, we need new institutions, not new duties on, on platforms. My question to Amy is whether platforms could be part of the solution. And I think that is interesting that in this sense, with all the criticism, the oversight board of, of Facebook is out of the box. It's the only, the only uh, I think, new institutions that we have seen that is independent. It's not government. It's not corporate. It's not even civil society. And that is really an interesting experiment. And my question here is to what extent uh, you could move from individual cases uh, or responding into more pro being more proactive from looking at individual cases into looking into issues that are more systemic because I think this is where the gaps are. Yeah, so um, yeah, clearly social media are not the only cause um, ills of democracy today, um, um, but they, um, you know, the, the studies do indicate that they are a significant factor, right? Um, and these are, I, I quote, uh, meta studies of social scientists, um, you know, finding that digital media are a causative factor for authoritarian populism, polarization, um, and one can point the finger at uh, a number of ways in which social media exacerbate what might be problems anyway, right? Uh, militant democracy arose well before there was social media, right? It obviously, um, you know, it is, uh, maybe every age has its challenges to democracy. Um, but uh, in our age, um, there, the, there are very serious problems with social media exacerbating what might otherwise be harmful polarization. And um, it's not just polarization, it's just the, the inability, it's epistemic, uncertainty, right? Uh, the ability to even agree on you know, what are the standards for determining what is true and what is false, right? The, the, the you know, as Steve Bannon put it, right? Let's just flood the zone with shit, right? Um, just the you know, utter wash of, of information which makes it impossible for many people to determine what is true and what isn't, right? So, um, and that I think, um, um, you know, there's lots of media that 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 also cause that. Here we have uh, Channel 14, Fox, quote unquote, news, the United States. Um, social media is not the only cause, um, um, but um, you know, I, I do think that, um, and, and the European regulations attempt to do this to require the major platforms to set out transparent criteria for determining what is trustworthy information. Um, to have independent fact checkers, you know, whatever resources we have available to us, um, we do want to, I think, impose upon these major players and very influential players in our public discourse. Uh, first of all, just to make a short comment, I always make that quick test when I have audiences who has social media, please raise your hand. Please do it quickly, kind of. Who read the community standards? Who can pass, who can pass an exam on the community standards? OK, don't try me. <laughs> and seriously, because when you ask that question, I always say there is a lot of responsibility on social media, and I will talk about it. But we never took accountability on ourselves, on learning. I mean, when we, we have a driving license, we understand the dangers. It doesn't occur to us to start driving without learning the signs 
and understanding how to behave on the road in Israel at least you take you know you take a theoretical exam and a practical exam but we all ride on the platform without even asking ourselves what kind of damages we are capable of making to others not to mention what it means how, how are we protecting ourselves our children our parents who decided at the age of 90 that they want to be active on the platforms but now to your question first of all maybe I didn't explain myself well enough we we believe that every case that we're taking is is is, is a an opportunity to talk about a systemic problem. It's never a personal problem. If it's not systemic, actually we're trying to group uh, user appeals in order to identify and, and we use all kind of means that we have in order to try and analyze the trends of the complaints that we are receiving. I think this is one of our most important responsibilities to try and understand what is going on. By the way, what is going on in a certain place on earth right now social media is disturbing or, or not protecting or enabling damage or and, and we know that this has happened before it is happening right now and unfortunately we hope it will have happen less but it's still possible that it will happen so this is one thing I thought that you would say I am surprised that the other platforms have not joined this experiment called the oversight board we believe that what has been created, and it, I really I'm the last person that will say that it's enough or that it's effective enough, but still it is making a difference. I would have expected by now to see Google, Twitter, YouTube, and, and Spotify and other, and we don't even understand how many challenges they have in terms of balancing between freedom of speech and the risks of what they are having on their platforms. So I think it's a question that should be asked and should be raised again publicly and the last thing I want to say I do want to mention that on the Trump decision we did say and expect Meta to implement that state actors have I wrote it to myself because I wanted to say it, have obligations under human rights standards to condemn violence to provide accurate information and to prevent misinformation according to the Robat Plan of Action and so forth. But again, if you haven't heard of it, and if we don't, I mean, the population of the world is not in an awareness that Meta has been told that. It is expected from Meta to behave differently, to implement it on all its platforms. We have a problem. So that, that, and this is why we appreciate so much this symposium and the opportunities to raise that and to mention that time and again. We have time for one more question. That's a dilemma. <laughs> Your choice. Please, Maya. So you're talking about a sort of a systemic uh, approach, and I wonder if you have it in the uh, in the form of uh, systemic enforcement. So you said that you group cases. So if you have a resolution of one case, if you follow up for all the cases, so let's put back all similar content. And then if it's later on translates to any uh, kind of adjustment in the content moderation uh, model as well, yes. translate, uh, translate uh, later to something to change uh, and how you're going to moderate content in the future. Not only that the implementation is never personal, I mean, we have the personal decision on a certain post, but then we have recommendations, and the implementation of our recommendations are about 60%. Some of them cost a lot of money, some of them are very complex to develop, but they are always concerning millions of users, at least. If not, it's not a recommendation that we will make. It, nev it will never be a personal one. So again, it is to be followed in order to understand how it's being implemented and what type of recommendation are being made on that platform. So, uh, I saw two uh, more hands, so we will take uh, those questions together and uh, we'll conclude with that. Don't you feel you are a little bit greenwashing Facebook? Yeah.
greenwash, greenwashing? Dafka green? How do you say Dafka in English? <laughs> Dafka greenwashing. Um, I, th by the way, when I accepted to join the board, this was the first question I was asked, but by one of our co-chairs. Um, I never saw myself as a person who could wash anything, anyone. I do believe that it takes courage to be part of this experiment. It didn't bring more love to my life. And it is full of frustration and determination. So I don't think that you will find me ever uh, saying something nice about Meta. And yet, I have the capability also because, you know, I'm not comparing the Ministry of Justice in Israel, of course, but I have directed a big organization and I know how difficult it is to change it, how difficult it is to receive that kind of oversight. And I know how open they are with us. They complain about us, they don't like us, and that's a good sign. But they are open and they, they if you will follow, and I'm really asking you and our decisions are translated in Hebrew after I found out that they're translated to Hungarian because of one of our other board members. Read one of those decisions and see what type of questions we are asking and what kind of answers we are receiving and how much transparency and openness it demands from Meta. And it's a start. Again, it's not I listen to you and I, 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 I felt uncomfortable. I, I wish I could speak after you spoke because there was a lot to say uh, and the DSA, for example, is a huge thing, but to implement what is demanded there is, it's, it's going to be a long way, a long way. So right now what we have is the oversight board, and the only one who has that is Meta. So let's try to make something out of it. Now the really, really absolutely final question. So uh, I fully sympathize with Neil's uh, argument that the social networks pose a uh, threat to democracy. By the way, not only to democracy, we still remember what happened in Myanmar when Facebook was used as the platform on which uh, the uh, killing and expulsion of Rohingyas was uh, coordinated and, and uh, uh, assisted. However, uh, social networks are not only Facebook. Social networks are also WhatsApp and my signal uh, uh, messaging uh, application and also YouTube. So I was wondering in practice how Orit and Neil, how do you think that uh, content moderation, transparency, accountability can be handled and implemented in a world in which such volumes of data is trafficking? I mean, take YouTube as an example, I think that hundreds of hours of video is being uploaded within a minute. How can it be governed in practice? How can the good uh, rules of the DSA can be uh, downscaled and implement, implemented in real life? And I'm a practitioner. I'm not an, uh, you know, so therefore I'm interested in practical questions. Sorry, you didn't ask me, but last night I had a discussion about this with Moran, and I just want to say something. I have this philosophical question in my mind all the time, and I said something very, very extreme. I said that because of the enormous amount of data, first of all, it's, I cannot imagine, I mean, even if we would recommend that Meta would have 10,000 human moderators in order to be accurate, there aren't 10,000 human moderators, 10,000 human moderators in Hebrew when there is a crisis in Israel. And that's the only way of, of keeping the platform safe and, and freedom of speech at its best. But there aren't 10,000 people who are willing to do that work. And, and you need my, to pay them. No, pay even them. if you pay them, even if you pay them, there aren't enough people who will say, this is what I want to do for a living for more than two days because that would be interesting. So, and, and trying to think about it globally. It might be impossible, and 
one of my thoughts, which is don't, you know, don't shoot me, is that it could be possible one day, Moran wanted to shoot me, that if you want to be safe on that platform, you will use it only in English. That would be the only play English or Spanish or a big language where you have a well-developed AI, because I want to remind you we had one decision that analyzed the content moderation here in Israel of Palestinian Arabic and Hebrew, and we had very disturbing conclusions about the weakness of AI on, on those languages. So those questions are not just about how as an idea, but also whether practically it's possible when the, the amount of data is so incredible. So thank you for the question. We were discussing also yesterday the, the problem of the, the enormous amount. Um, first, we can ask ChatGPT what uh, solution does it have for this problem? And uh, more seriously, I think uh, first, maybe AI could be part of the solution, not only part of the problem. And uh, if we will look again at the content idea as a paradigmatic um, uh, example, I think not all the enormous amount of data is a problematic one. I think the problematic a uh, speech is less than 1%. So this is uh, the answer. It's not the enormous amount. The question is how should we tackle, how should we address the 1% or even the, in, in the, the YouTube case, as when we, we're talking about uh, copyright uh, allegedly infringing content, it's less than half percent. So let's you know, focus on the, the real problem. And then I think the, the solutions are much more uh, doable. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo, I think it's, it's, it, the, the major problem has to be addressed by technological solutions. So with WhatsApp, for example, I think it was India that finally limited the number of people that can be part of a WhatsApp group, right? Because... Uh, no, Facebook did it in India. Did it in oh, still, Facebook did it in India. Okay, yeah. So, um, and then AI also. I mean, it's not, it's, it's certainly not perfect. There could be lots of mistakes, but at least to get at the heart of the, the issue um, on a gross level, it's got to be something like that, I think. I, I just will say that I think because of the problem of the scale of the and the and the speed, we should the regulation should not be about the content, but rather about the content uh, traffic. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons. But we, I, I think, one of the obligation, I think, also in, in Israel, should be that more content moderators in the language of this country. So I think both. Okay, thank you. And now to the moment you've all been waiting for. Uh, lunch is served downstairs in the garden. We are back at 2.30. <laughs>